All right, well, it is uh, a pleasure to join you today uh, from the presenter's seat and uh, not just from the moderator's seat. Uh, I will be giving the session today on artificial intelligence and nuclear imaging. I am an abdominal imaging fellow at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, as well as an informatics fellow. And again, I want to uh, recognize and thank uh, RSNA for their support for this program, the opportunities that we've had to expand it to so many participants and participating programs throughout the country uh, and internationally. So our objectives today, I want to discuss the clinical AI uh, applications as they relate to nuclear medicine. Uh, I also hope to demonstrate some of the connections to the core AI concepts that we've been discussing over the course of the week. And I will briefly touch on some of the economics and app, or, uh, clinical implementation strategies for AI. And we'll also be uh, touching on that on, in further detail with the next session with Dr. Trevetti. We will be doing some audience participation today. Uh, so I've integrated some core, core style questions into this presentation. Uh, since we do have a, a very mixed uh, group of people who are going to be watching this. We have an in-person audience. We have people watching uh, as a group on Zoom, uh, watching individually on Zoom. Uh, we won't be having any polling that's done. So for those of you who uh, are able to answer uh, individually, you can put your answer into the chat or into the Q&A. Uh, and those of you who uh, are not on the, on the chat personally, you can uh, choose the answer in your own mind and give yourself a pat on the back when you get the answer correct. And for those of you here in person, if, uh, if the spirit so moves you, you can uh, just shout out the answer. So there are a few things about nuclear medicine that makes, uh, makes it different compared to some of the other subspecialties as it relates to AI. So nuclear medicine is truly head to toe imaging. We have several such studies that go truly from the vertex of the scalp to the bottom of the feet. It covers multiple modalities. We have integration with SPECT, with CT, with PET, and we have different contrast media. We have different tracers. And so all of these things uh, introduce their own opportunities for AI to be integrated into the nuclear medicine process, uh, but also int introduce challenges as well. It's also important to remember that uh, in the nuclear medicine department, it's not only mo molecular imaging, but it's also therapeutics. So uh, it's, a, it's a bigger world than uh, just I-131. We have a number of therapies related to targeted alpha therapy for bone metastases. We have therapies for neuroendocrine tumor. And these applications will only continue to increase with uh, monoclonal an antibody-related therapies. So what does a, general, or a day look like on the general nuclear medicine service? So we might start with a HIDA scan. And then we might move over to a bone study or a bone scan. And looks like we have a pet that's on the list. And look at that, we have another pet on the list. We have two different types of pets uh, with different types of tracer uptake and activity. Then we might move on to a VQ scan, we might move to a gastric emptying study after that. And it's not even 10 a.m. So we have studies that are occurring all over the body, uh, all different types of organ systems. Uh, so it is a very, very diverse set of images that we're looking at. And even beyond the images themselves, there are dozens of steps that are involved in the imaging process uh, before we even get to the images. So in many ways, our studies start not in the radiology department, but in the exam room that uh, a patient will be seeing their primary provider. The primary provider will be doing their own decision making. They'll be deciding on what pathology they want to evaluate, they will order the exam, then that exam has to be translated into uh, uh, our department, that it comes to the nuclear medicine department where the patient is scheduled. Uh, they might have uh, pre uh, preparation that's required for the patient if they have to stop different medications, if they have to follow a certain kind of diet. And then once the patient comes to the department, the uh, images are acquired, the images are processed, and then only at that point does the radiologist uh, provide their interpretation and upload that report to the electronic health record. So here we come to our first question. 
So an algorithm that uses AI to convert a noisy PET CT image into a diagnostic quality CT is an example of A, decision support, B, deep learning reconstruction, C, automated segmentation, or D, supervised learning. I'll take a, a moment for you all to read this question again and decide on your answer. All right, and I've gotten a few answers in the chat. And if you have decided on deep learning reconstruction, you are correct. So give yourself a pat on the back. So deep learning reconstruction or DLR uh, is a topic that we've touched on briefly in some of the other lectures uh, two days ago with Dr. Smith and also yesterday with uh, Dr. Yi. But briefly, this is a reconstruction algorithm uh, that generates higher quality images from uh, less data. So when we've spoken about a study that uh, uses less radiation, being able to be converted into a study uh, that be, may be higher quality with more radiation or using a study that uses less tracer or less contrast into an image that would uh, be similar to one that has, uh, has more contrast, uh, this would be an example of how deep learning reconstruction can be applied. This concept is not distinct to nuclear medicine. It can be used uh, in MRI and CT, like we said, uh, but also has applications in PET and SPECT. And deep learning reconstruction uh, is an example of what is termed upstream AI. And we'll touch on this concept in a moment as, uh, in a little bit more depth. So just as uh, a visual example of what DLR can do, uh, those of you that have been on the PET service and that have seen a PET CT know that with these low dose CTs, uh, just by the nature of how we acquire these images with a large field of view with low dose or lower dose uh, of radiation, uh, these images of the head are going to have a lot more streak artifact, they have beam hardening artifacts and are just a lower diagnostic quality uh, than, than what we would have in a diagnostic or a dedicated CT head. So if we start with this image on the left and then apply our deep learning reconstruction algorithm, it could output a more diagnostic quality CT like what we have on the right. So upstream AI is a type of application that affects the steps before radiologist interpretation. So when we were talking about the diagram earlier, all of the steps before we get to the radiology interpretation, those are areas of opportunity for upstream AI to come into play. So these uh, applications are not necessarily directly related to diagnosis. They can be, but they can be uh, related more to uh, image processing. They can be related to uh, even decision support for the ordering physician. They can be uh, related to patient scheduling. And then like we were talking about with the deep learning reconstruction, they can be uh, uh, related to deep learning reconstruction, dose reduction, uh, radiation reduction, uh, and all of these are opportunities for upstream AI to be involved. And this brings us into uh, this concept of uh, a brief overview of uh, the economics of AI. So when you're wondering how does AI generate re return on investment, uh, a tool has to uh, generate this return by either increasing res revenue or decreasing cost. So when we're able to decrease scan time, uh, if we're able to decrease the scan time from 30 minutes to 15 minutes, at which point we can do four, uh, four exams in an hour as opposed to two, uh, you can see that that would increase our throughput, which would increase the revenue that we would generate in a single day. It can also decrease costs. So if uh, there was an exam that required a very expensive radio tracer, if we're able to get diagnostic images with half the dose, then we would be able to decrease the amount of dose required and decrease the cost of the exam to the hospital. So these upstream tools and non-interpretive tools, uh, despite not necessarily getting as much attention as the diagnostic tools, like the ones that are very flashy that can highlight a pneumothorax or the ones that can highlight an intracranial hemorrhage, uh, these are uh, maybe a little, a little less uh, flashy, but they can generate a much more concrete return on investment uh, that we can uh, use to demonstrate the, the worth to their department, to the hospital. So on the flip side from these upstream uh, applications or these non-interpretive applications, we have computer-aided detection. 
Uh, these are tools that assist in the detection and or diagnosis of pathology. These types of tools require uh, an extensive amount of training. Uh, these often are supervised or semi-supervised learning. So uh, like what Dr. Satude was talking about Monday, uh, this is when a radiologist comes and provides oversight and uh, uses their expertise uh, to label images and to mark uh, whether the pathology is present or absent and uh, kind of help the algorithm to establish the ground truth, which is the uh, true truth that it will be using to make its decisions. An important thing to know about uh, computer aid detection is that these uh, can be subject to overfitting, that they can have very variable performance once they get out into the real world, uh, just based on uh, technical issues or such as image quality, and then also patient population issues, that it might have been trained on a more homogenous uh, patient population when it gets out into the real world, that uh, it's exposed to all the varieties that the, of people and backgrounds and uh, situations that patients come from might not perform as well. <laughs> so just to give a visualization of how some of these trainings work, uh, say hypothetically, we have a pet related algorithm that is trained on hundreds and thousands of pet related images uh, so that when it sees this pet seat or this uh, pet image, it's able to say, I do not detect any increased uptake or abnormal increased uptake. And then on the flip side, if we see this image that goes through the algorithm, it detects areas of uh, abnormal uptake on which it applies a bounding box or heat map. And then once it uh, applies this heat map, it can take us to an autopilot mode, which would take us to the CT which will show us this abnormal area of uptake corresponding to a uh, hypermetabolic colon mass. So this is, just a, this is just a hypothetical example of how one of these algorithms that's trained and retrained and retrained uh, can identify abnormal findings and can integrate into workflow to uh, assist in the detection of uh, different pathologies on nuclear, nuclear medicine scans. So this takes us to our second question. A radiologist trains an AI algorithm to identify a study by type or type by labeling the training images. This is an example of A, supervised learning, B, unsupervised learning, C, black box, or D, explainable AI. My apologies for my stutter. I will allow you to read that uh, in your own mind and do it correctly. All right, well, that was fast. I'm already getting some correct answers that are uh, A, supervised learning. Very well done. So I may, have, I may have set you up a little bit too easily for that one. So this one's gonna be maybe a bit more challenging. Uh, an algorithm that detects abnormal uptake on FDG PET scan highlights the region of interest with a red bounding box. This is an example of a, supervised learning, B, unsupervised learning, C, black box AI, or D, explainable AI. Take a moment for you to read this question again, make your decision. And if you answered D, explainable AI, you are correct. So uh, this concept of black box AI and explainable AI is uh, a very important one and one that uh, is especially important for uh, computer aided detection related tools that uh, it is one of the pitfalls that some of these algorithms are so, uh, uh, you know, perhaps clandestine in their decision making uh, and uh, it's just completely unintelligible to uh, human perception. So when we feed images into this algorithm and it makes, you know, potentially a life-changing or it makes a life-changing decision and a life-changing result, uh, it's important for us to be able to understand why these decisions are being made. So as a uh, somewhat extreme example of this, so if we had this same pet image that came across and we applied our AI algorithm and it's making all of its decisions in this black box and it results in cancer, that would be a little bit unnerving that it's making this diagnosis and we don't have any uh, really rationale for why this is happening. So 
Uh, one of the ways that we're able to get around this is with uh, explainable AI. And some of these strategies uh, would include uh, taking the same image, applying our algorithm and resulting abnormal uptake, which then takes us to uh, the same image where the algorithm would apply a heat map where the radiologist would be able to go in and say, oh, well, I think this is a physiologic uptake, or I think this is a, an artifact, and I think that it's not necessarily a real finding, or they would be able to say, oh, this looks like a real finding, it's able to, or, uh, and then move forward with the exam from there. All right, and the uh, topic that we will close with will be segmentation and quantification. So these are tools that are uh, able to assist in the uh, somewhat, well, certainly not somewhat, the uh, certainly burdensome and time intensive tasks of segmentation or quantification in a nuclear medicine scan. So these uh, types of tools have uh, an overlap between diagnostic and upstream types of tools, and they usually require uh, oversight from a radiologist or a technician. So over time, these will require feedback and retraining. Uh, and there is this concept of uh, something called algorithm drift, that when we have some of these tools and they I may initially start with high performance, but over time, the performance can become uh, less accurate or it's less reliable. Uh, it can be necessary to go back and retrain this uh, algorithm so it uh, maintains its performance. <laughs> So this leads us to our final question of uh, this session, which of the following could apply to an AI algorithm for I-131 dosing for Graves' disease? A, automated thyroid segmentation on the pretreatment scan. B, a dose calculator integrated with the ele electronic medical record. C, patient scheduling algorithm for automating patient instructions and follow-up exams. D, computer aid detection for residual iodine uptake or E, all of the above. Now, I'm not even gonna give you any time to think about that one because this is just good test taking strategy. If I took, out all, it took all the time to write out these dang answers and I'm not gonna make you, I'm gonna give you all of the above, it's gonna be all of the above. <laughs> all right, and so segmentation and quantification uh, has applications across, uh, across body or, or across the specialties, uh, but in nuclear medicine, it uh, can be applied to a lot of different uh, types of scans as well. So for cardiac imaging, renal scintigraphy, gastric emptying, really anything that you're uh, calculating uh, an ejection fraction a volume or segmenting a structure, having an AI algorithm to assist in that can be helpful to uh, just decrease the burden on the radiologists and technologists who might be having to do that by hand. Uh, one area of particular interest in this, uh, in this subject is oncology imaging. So uh, in patients who are having serial scans, such as PET CTs, this is able to increase the uniformity of these reports and it's uh, helpful in guiding treatment and uh, you know, gauging the response to therapy. And additionally, like we were uh, mentioning earlier with the increase in, uh, in theranostics or therapeutics that we do in nuclear medicine. Uh, this can be very helpful in uh, estimating the disease burden and helping to guide treatment for some of these uh, targeted therapies that we do uh, in nuclear medicine. So this is just a review of our objectives for the day. I hope that we've uh, adequately address these. So I hope to discuss the clinical AI applications. So we've talked about deep learning reconstruction, other imaging pro image processing modalities, computer aided detection and segmentation and quantification. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate some of the connections of these core AI competencies to uh, nuclear medicine AI. So we've talked about upstream AI, the uh, explainable versus black box and supervised and unsupervised learning. And we briefly touched on some of the economics of clinical AI, like return on investment, uh, reducing scan time, and increasing throughput. So these are my references here. And I will happily take any questions that you might have. Yes, OK, I do have a question here. And I apologize, I didn't clarify. Uh, or I didn't say this more clearly. So the uh, questions that I included here were not uh, uh, 
they were not core questions, they were uh, core style questions. So uh, currently the AI is not uh, tested heavily on the American board exam for radiology. Uh, I believe that when I read the non-interpretive skills document two years ago, it was maybe uh, maybe two paragraphs out of a 40 page document related to AI. Is that still correct? Was that a, all right. The audience says that's correct. Um, but I, I don't think that it's unreasonable in the next, you know, five to 10 years or so that it could be a larger part of the core exam. And you know, in the near future, it could even be, uh, it could be a part of the exam that's taught in the same way that physics is taught, that it's uh, considered a core competency. Uh, but yes, that is a good question. Thank you for, uh, for clarifying that. All right, well, I greatly appreciate you all uh, giving me this time today. If you have any additional questions or uh, if you would like to be involved in this course in the future, if you would like to uh, stay updated on what we do here uh, in our AI group, please follow us on Twitter. You can uh, feel free to email me personally. Uh, feel free to take a screenshot of this, this slide. And if I can take uh, one moment more, I want to recognize uh, one of my inspirations for this course uh, and inspirations in general. Uh, this is my grandfather, Herman Perchik. Uh, would have been his 91st birthday this last Sunday, but sadly he passed away just a few weeks ago. Uh, he was a lifelong uh, electrical engineer, but uh, during my lifetime, after he retired, I knew him better as a teacher. Uh, he taught math for the GED and uh, uh, in the same school that my grandmother taught, uh, where she taught English as a second language. Uh, they both taught well into their 80s. And uh, in some ways, I feel like this course and these lectures are and my opportunity to make good on their commitment and continue that legacy of education. So I greatly appreciate your time uh, and this opportunity. And we will be taking a brief break and we'll reconvene with Dr. Trivedi uh, in a moment here. So thank you again for your time today.